All right, so just as a reminder, we um we were going over the um, six kingdoms. We talked about four out of the six. We talked about the animal kingdom, plant kingdom, um, protists, and fungi. And so we have two left to talk about. Um, and they're probably the two you may be least familiar with, bacteria and archaea. Um, so bacteria are some of the simplest living things. They're very, very small. Um, they're very simple types of cells. Um, and so their characteristics, they're all unicellular, meaning they're one cell. And so far, everything we've talked about so far has been eukaryotes. But bacteria are not. Bacteria are prokaryotes. So again, that means they have no nuclear membrane, so they don't have a nucleus. The DNA is just spread around the cytoplasm. They also don't have other membrane-bound organelles, so they're much simpler than other types of cells. Doesn't bacteria make Some. Um, and they can be autotrophs or heterotrophs. It depends which bacteria you're talking about. Some bacteria can make their own food, others cannot. And when we talk about examples, um, it just says up here bacteria, but there's a few types of bacteria that you probably know the name of. For example, the one that causes a sore throat. What's the name of that type of bacteria? Yeah, it's called Streptococcus is the actual name. That's where strep throat comes from. Um, how about one that would cause food poisoning? Wait, I have a question. Hold on. What's the name of a bacteria, Jack? E. coli. E. coli. Certain types of E. coli can cause food poisoning. What kind of bacteria may you have to be careful of if you're preparing chicken? Salmonella. Salmonella. <laughs> so again, those are different types of bacteria, but don't make the mistake of thinking that all bacteria are dangerous or can cause you to become ill. Some bacteria we need, some bacteria are helpful to us. We have um, billions of bacteria living inside of our digestive system. They help us break down and digest certain foods and nutrients that we eat. So bacteria can be helpful. Um, Sometimes they could cause disease, but not always. What was your question, Jenna? How is bacteria an example of bacteria? It's not really. It's, I really should list those, those things I was just talking about. Oh. E. coli, salmonella, um, strep. Oh, good stuff. All right. So those are the bacteria. Now, the last group, you know, in the, in the past, we really would only talk about five kingdoms. But now we've added in a sixth. Uh, and that's because this last kingdom was a little bit... Um, used to be lumped together with bacteria um, because they share some certain things in common. But scientists now, after being um, able to closely analyze their DNA, they found that this group, the archaea, they're not actually that closely related to bacteria. Okay? So they've changed that and they've broken them out into their own kingdom. The members of archaea, they still have some things in common. So they're all, also unicellular. They're also prokaryotes. And they also can be autotroph or heterotroph. So they have those similarities, but when they scientists actually looked at their DNA, they found, well, they're not exactly the same as bacteria, so they separated them out. And these archaea were found in some of the most extreme conditions on Earth, places where scientists thought probably nothing could survive, like in a geyser, in a... Um, in um, ice conditions under in the Arctic, in extreme salt conditions or high acidity, um, in deep ocean vents. They thought that probably nothing could survive some of these conditions, but when they look carefully, they see that there are things that can survive, and many of them are in this kingdom of Archaea. And they're sometimes called the extremophiles, meaning they're organisms that can live under very extreme conditions. Jenna? That's a, that's a geyser or a steam vent coming from the earth. They're very hot and all these oh. chemicals uh, erupt from the earth. And they find these archaea that can live and survive under those conditions. Will you put, like, oil in your hand if you put, like, your hand in a geyser? Yes. Okay. 
if we think about and look at sort of out of all the species that we have identified, scientists have identified, the majority that have been identified are animals. From here all the way around, including this section, almost 75% are animals. Okay. More than half are alone are just insects. That's the, that's the most um, mo animal with the most species in it. Then plants are over here in this section. There's quite a few plants that have been identified. And then the other things, the protists, the fungi, the bacteria, there are much smaller sections of species that have been identified. If we do a, a comparison of our six kingdoms, we could fill this in pretty easily. So how does it obtain food? What are the two words that we're gonna, I'm going to use here? What are the two words that we learned yesterday pertain to getting energy? Heterotroph and autotroph. Yeah, heterotroph and autotroph. So raise your hand if you can tell me, what is an animal? Autotroph, heterotroph, or both? Anna? Yeah, they're heterotrophs. How about plants? The plant kingdom. Maggie? Auto. They are autotrophs. Couldn't it be both? Not plants. All plants are autotrophs. What about Venus bloodcast? Still an autotroph. Still makes its own food. They don't eat insects um, for energy. They really are eating them for minerals and nutrients. Do they need them to live? Sometimes. They often, those carnivorous plants live in places where the soil is very low in nutrients, like nitrogen or phosphorus, and so they actually track those insects, digest their body, and get phosphorus out of them. But they still make glucose in their, um, in their tissue through photosynthesis. All right, fungi. Autotrophs, heterotrophs, both? Hetero. Both. Jacob? Hetero. And they're heterotrophs. They have to break down, you know, dead organic matter and waste products in order to get their energy. How about protists, those single-celled organisms we talked about? Nick? Both? Yeah, they can be both. Some are autotrophs, some are heterotrophs, so they can be both. And the same is true of bacteria and archaea. Some of them are autotrophs, some are heterotrophs, so they can also be both. Now I guess if you know this column, this next column is pretty easy. So do the cells contain chloroplasts or chlorophyll? Animal cells, do they yes. contain chloroplasts? Raise your hand, please, if you want to tell me what you think. Jenna? Yeah. Animal cells do? Yeah. They have chloroplasts? Oh, no. Plants do not. Animals do not. Plants do. You are correct there. What about fungi? Fungi have chloroplasts or chlorophyll? Nope. No. They're heterotrophs. They don't have. What are they talking about? What? They're talking about fungi. Protists? Yeah. Yes. Maybe. Both. Kind of. Some, we're going to say. Because some do, some don't. Mm -hmm. some. And bacteria and archaea? Some. Yeah, some of them have chlorophyll so they can go through photosynthesis, and some do not. All right, now how many cells, what are the two words that we're gonna use here, Nate? Multicellular and then unicellular. Correct. So what about animals? What, which word pertains to animals? Rachel? Yeah, they're multicellular. How about plants? Nick? Multi? Also multicellular, yeah. How about fungi? Maggie? Some. But there are some single-celled fungi. Are you multi? So we're going to say multi and uni, or you could say both.
How about protests? Joseph? Yeah, oh no, not, not both. Protists are all single cell. And so are bacteria and so are archaea. They're all single cell organisms. All right, last one, eukaryote or prokaryote. Remind me of what the terms mean. Prokaryote, what does that mean? Jamie? They have no nucleus. Eukaryote. Sydney? Has a nucleus. All right, so animals. Eukaryote or prokaryote? Jacob? Eukaryote. They're eukaryote. How about plants? Jack? Also eukaryote. How about fungi? Maggie? Eukaryote. How about protists? Jacob? No, they're actually eukaryotes. They do have a nucleus. They have complex organelles. <coughs> Bacteria, Anna? Prokaryotes. They are prokaryotes. And archaea? Joe? Pro. Also pro. Daniel, question? If this doesn't have a nucleus, how does it um, control? Because it still has DNA which is what's really responsible for that inside the nucleus. It's just spread throughout the cytoplasm. Anna? Uh, yeah, you'll have to know this stuff. Not quite fill it out, but this information is on your quiz. All right, now, so these are the kingdoms. There are six kingdoms. But we know that there's a level above kingdom. What is it? Domain. 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 And there are just three domains. It's a group even higher than kingdom. And so there's three domains. So all of these kingdoms are in one of three domains. And animals, plants, fungi, and protists, they belong in one domain. They're classified in one domain. Then bacteria have their own domain, and archaea have their own domain. This domain is called eukarya, and that one's called bacteria and archaea. Oh, really? So why do you think all four of these things are in one domain? Why are those all together? They seem pretty different from each other. Anna? Because they're all eukaryotes. Yeah, they're all eukaryotes. So those things all got put together because all of them are cells that have a nucleus and nuclear membrane, whereas the bacteria and archaea do not. Or they don't have Why that. The bacteria and archaea the same thing? Because when scientists looked at their DNA, uh, they found they were originally in with, archaea was in with bacteria. Then as scientists further studied them, they found well, they're not as close related as we thought, so they split them up into two separate domains. And so this is the system we have, three domains. Uh, are you, yeah, where are they? Where the, uh, Eukarya? Archaea? Oh, Archaea, yeah. Um, are they dangerous? No, not really. Not, not that I know of. Jenna? I don't know about her. Quickly. All right, so if we look here at some, a few different species, a human, a chimp, a house cat, a lion, and a fly, okay? Um, we can see their classification from domain all the way down to species. Okay. Now, for a human, what's the scientific name of a human? Jacob? Um, wait, homo sapiens. Yeah, homo sapiens. And again, scientific names come from the genus and the species. That's why that's our scientific name. It comes from our genus and our species. Remember the rules of writing this. The genus, the first word is capitalized. The species, which is the second part of the name, is a lowercase of i. And we also underline it if we're writing it by hand. We underline it. The words. What words? Mine is not underlined because what did I do? Typed it. Italics. So it's either in italics or if you're writing by hand, you can underline. All right, what's the scientific name for a chimp? Both. What's the 
scientific name for a chimp? Pantrolodites. Pantrolodites. <laughs> Pan is the genus. <laughs> Troglodytes <laughs> is the species name. How did you know that? It's listed right here. <laughs> Pan is the genus. Troglodytes is the species. So those two things combined give the scientific name. How about, raise your hand please. House cat, Joe. Well, on yours, that's what it says. Uh, the technical, though, I, that's incorrect. The scientific name really is Felis Caddis. You could change them if you want on yours. Would you be mad if we put, put Felis Domestica? Well, that's what you have on yours, so um, don't worry about it. You You're not going to have to memorize these. How about a lion? What's the scientific name of a lion, Jeff? Felis Leo. Felis Leo. And... Last, a house fly, Maggie? Musca domestica. Musca domestica, correct. Yep. Um, all right, so if we look at these species, the chimp, the human, the cat, the lion, the house fly, all of them belong to the same two taxa, groups of classification. Which two do they have in common? All of these things. Anna? Domain and kingdom. Yeah, they're all in the same domain and kingdom. They're all in the domain eukarya and the kingdom animal. All these things are animals. As we go down further, though, they start to get split up. Because the human, the chimp, the cat, and the lion, they are all, um, they are all animals of the backbone, chordates, versus the house fly, which is not. That's an arthropod. Oh. All right. So everything in these charts, all these um, five species have some things in common. Are they all multicellular or unicellular? Raise your hand if you can tell me that. Rachel? They're all multicellular. Are they eukaryotes or prokaryotes? Jacob? Eukaryotes. They're all eukaryotes. Are they autotrophs or heterotrophs? Heterotrophs. So out of these five species, which two do you think are most closely related to each other? Nate? The human and the chimp. Think so? Let's look at the human and the chimp. They are the same domain and kingdom and phylum and class and order, but if we go beyond that, Different families, different genus, different species. Nate, you want to change your answer? Yes, yeah, the house cat and the lion. Yeah, if we look at the house cat and the lion, they are the same all the way down until we get to the lowest level, the species level, then they are different. So the house cat and the lion, they are the most closely related wait, out of these groups. Wait, um, Mr. Ross? Yes. Yeah. Wait, wait, don't carnivores eat um, meat? No, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So why do I eat these? So <laughs> what? So why don't we be carnivores? Because we're really omnivores. And it doesn't really necessarily, it's more about the teeth and the shape of their teeth that they're in that group, not so much about what they eat. All right, our last section, our last topic that we need to know about in this unit is something called using taxonomic keys. They're also called dichotomous keys. And a key is a tool that a scientist or a person, anybody can use to identify an unknown species. So for example, if you went out and you grabbed a plant from the ground, you could bring that plant inside and look at it, and then you could use this book here to identify it. This is a dichotomous key, this is one I had to use in college, that is a key to plants in Northeast United States. So basically, you look at your plant, and you follow through a set of steps, and answer a bunch of questions, and eventually it tells you what type of plant that is. Here's another one I had to use. This one is about fruit and twigs of trees. So if you take a twig off a tree and you look through this and follow the steps, it'll tell you what type of tree it came from. Okay? That's what a dichotomous key is used for. You're gonna have to know how to use one um, and that will have several activities to help us with that. But let's look at two examples here today, pretty simple ones. So here I have some finches some birds, just a little picture of each. 
And let's say we want to identify which types of finches these are. What I can do is use a taxonomic key like this to identify them. And it's set up pretty simply. Each number has a set of two statements. You always start at the top at number one, and you read the statements and decide which one applies to the thing you're looking at. And then you follow the instructions. So for example, let's look at this finch in the top left corner. We start at one. We read one A and one B. So one A, is the beak very thin, and the upper beak is much larger than the bottom beak? Or is the beak relatively heavy, and the top and bottom are nearly equal in size? Yes. What would you say? B. Yeah, I would say B. So we follow over and says, OK, now you need to go to set two. So I go to set two. Can you circle me? Uh, you don't have to circle me, no. Do the lower, the lower beak is smaller than the top beak? No. Or is it as large or larger than the top beak? It's a B. It's about as large. Okay, now I have to go to set three. Is the lower edge of the beak have a distinct bend, or is the lower edge of the upper bill flat? Look at the very end though of this. See that section there? That's that bend. This, this is a Camarinchus finch. Go ahead, write that in. That is Camarinchus finch. We've identified it by using this key. Even though we don't have to really know very much about the finches to use this key, we just have to look and um, answer these questions. A well-made key um, can kind of make it very easy. Let's look at this finch below that. Is the beak very thin? Upper beak much larger than the bottom? No. No, they're about equal in size. Let's go to two. Is the lower beak smaller than the top beak? No. Yes. Okay. Um, or are they about the same? About the same. Oh, the same. Top is bigger. The same. Top is bigger. Yeah, top, top is top definitely bigger. bigger. Yeah, this is a Geospiza finch. So look at this one. Is the beak very thin? No. Or is it relatively heavy? Relatively heavy. Go to two. Is the lower beak smaller than the top beak? No. Or are they as large or larger? As large or larger. Go to set three. It's going to be a Does the lower edge have a distinct bend, or is it mostly flat? Mostly flat. Yes? This is plasma. Flat is spies up. It sounds like it goes splat. And then finally, is the beak very thin? Upper beak much larger than the lower beak? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it is. So we don't have to go any further. This is the third Dia finch. That was easy. Oh, I thought that was easy. So we just follow through until it tells us what we're looking at. Now, obviously, with a, a key like the one I have up there, this one, it's that's a lot more complex. It's very uh, detailed and technical. But it works on the same ideas, a set of statements in which you have to decide and do what it says. All right, our last one for today. So, I have here some species and a key to identify. Let's pretend we know nothing about these things. Who could walk me through the steps to identify this creature? All right, Jacob, for number one, what do you say? Tentacles present or tentacles absent? Tentacles present. Yes, so we go to two. Then what? Me again? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I would say eight tentacles. Correct. It is an octopus. So Woo! -hoo. We've used our key to identify. Who wants to do this one? Me. Jenna. <laughs> Number um, one. What would you say? Tentacles are absent. Absent. So next um, we go to four. What would um, you say there? It doesn't have a pair of giant claws, so it's a shrimp. Yes, I think by it's a shrimp. Oh my gosh. All right, you guys don't have it. I mean, I don't have it up here. You do have it. This organism right here. What could you do? Nick, what's that one? Jellyfish. Read. Go through the steps. Uh, um, tentacles present. Yep. Um, more than eight tentacles. Okay. And tenta tentacles hang down. Yes, jellyfish. How about this one? Who could do that? Yeah. Um, would it, would it no. Yep. And the tentacles 